this week on Pep Talk. I set up Nightcap this year, which I floated on the stock market early on this year. I was just reading that. London Cocktail Club you bought, right? I was just like, yes. how have you done that in a year? I define success in any business is when I've made myself redundant. And I'm almost ruthlessly protective, I think, of my time. Once you can make yourself redundant from a business, it's successful. No one sees the rhino coming, right? The rhino looks so big and so enormous and he looks so slow. You just underestimate him. And that's how you feel sometimes when you walk into the room. Allow it to be your superpower because without a doubt, it has been mine. Our mission is to help 10 million people start and grow a business. In Pep Talk, we interview industry leading experts from around the world who share actionable know-how and life lessons. That's why we're excited to team up with GoDaddy to power Pep Talk. I have been using GoDaddy for years and would promote them on this podcast even if they didn't sponsor us. You can use their free website builder and start your online business at no cost, for example. You don't need lots of money to start a business if you leverage the tools at the Purposeful Project and GoDaddy. GoDaddy even help with naming a business. Check out the links in the podcast notes below to connect to GoDaddy tools. Sarah, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Perhaps for those that don't know you, could you take a moment just to introduce yourself and what you do? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Sarah Winningham. I was one of the dragons on BBC's Dragon's Den. I am an investor, uh, which I'm sure nobody will be surprised to hear, and uh, an entrepreneur. I'm a mum of four, um, and I, I spend most of my time at the moment in hospitality uh, business that we just started actually in lockdown just a year ago uh, and got lots of late night party uh, quality brands, um, bars across most of most of London and outside, uh, starting to open lots outside outside of London as well. Yeah, I was reading your bio and I think you did a great job explaining what you do there because it's <laughs> it's quite an extensive list of things that you've done and that you are doing. And 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 I I'm excited to share with my audience today uh, as a kind of main theme for today's podcast, you know, how to get investment. Now you've done both. You've you've raised money, of course, you do also invest. So I really yeah. want to get into that today and, and teach people a little bit about maybe how to approach getting investment, what you've sure. seen that works, and, and talk a little bit about that. Now before we get into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your your career. Now, um I, I of course uh, because of Dragon's Den, which I, I've watched and have seen all your episodes, um, I'm a big fan, and so is my four-year-old, and he loves uh, he loves guessing whether or not you're in or out. I think one of the things that's really interesting is it, it brings up a lot in that episode that you were part of the expansion team for Peaks Express, and 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 I'd love to know, um, and also that for that matter, Planet Hollywood as well. I'd love to know how that started. Where that? How did that part of your career happen? How did you end up? taking on such a big task? So I've always like had a part-time job in, in hospitality. So from, from a very, very young age, um, it was like, I used to work in the local market serving sticky buns and, um, uh, cake and stuff to the, the market traders with pots of strong tea. And then, uh, ended up getting a job in actually it was really cool bar when I was young. It was a place that, uh, that everybody used to go out. So I thought, well, I can't really afford to go out, but if I actually get a job working there, then at least it feels like I'm going out on a Friday and Saturday night, which is quite cool. So I've always spent time in hospitality. Then, uh, fast forward a little bit and I was living in Paris and there was a fantastic, uh, pub called the frog and roast beef and i used to work there on a uh sat sunday afternoon sometimes on a saturday and uh the people who owned the frog and roast beef were two mba graduates from insead and they were planning on rolling out the the brand at the time i'm in my early 20s at this point i think i'm like 20 20 or 21 and they, the people who had helped them to design and build and uh, project management, the opening of the Frog and Roast Beef in Paris, were also doing the Planet Hollywood Champs-Élysées. And they were having an absolute nightmare with the Americans trying to understand the way that the French work and vice versa. You can imagine the two cultures are like totally opposite ends. And, and they came to the owners of the Frog and Roast Beef and said, 
please, can you help us? Is there any way one of you can just come and work for two or three months and just help us bridge this gap between the two? And to this day, I'm so grateful, but they said, no. However, there's this girl who works on a Sunday afternoon. It's probably worth you speaking to her. And, you know, you never know who who's who's with you at the time. I, I still to this day don't know why. And I'm so grateful. And that was how I then ended up working in more of the sort of head office function, the growth function of hospitality. And I loved it. Um, I then worked for Planet Hollywood. Um, they offered me a job in Europe looking after the international franchising, the European franchising, actually, really early on. Loved it. Thought it was brilliant. And then um, I moved to Pizza Express because, again, they were looking. I, I actually, the Planet Hollywood business model quite clearly wasn't a sustainable business model, even at my tender age of like 23. It's like, this can't work. You can't spend that much money opening a site and then um, only turn do that amount of sales every week and still make money. It's it, the, the maths don't work. And then so then I um, bought the FT, sat down at the FT, my desk, thinking I was so clever with this really big paper in front of me, and just went through the newspaper thinking, what am I going to do next? And there were two articles in the paper at the time. Uh, one was about Hugh Osmond and Luke Johnson uh, having just acquired Pizza Express. And there was another one about the open. I think it was the first opening or something of, of a Pret-a-Manger. And I thought those two concepts have got legs for international expansion. So I contacted both of the businesses and said, look, this is what I've been doing for Planet Hollywood. I would love to come and do it with uh, your brand, and open up abroad and Pret a Manger. I don't even think I got through to the right person. They were like, who the hell's this crazy bonkers person? But Pizza Express said, come in. Um, so I did. And they did that is, I ended up running the international department of Pizza Express. Loved it. Great job. Absolutely brilliant. And that was really how I got into it. Now, in fact, that I never had this big desire to be an entrepreneur or anything. I was not like, oh, I want to go off and work on my own. And um, it, I, I was actually very, very happy in my 20s, learning, surrounded by great people. I was traveling a lot. I mean, I loved it. Um, during that time, I was very, very lucky that actually it became very apparent that international expansion was not core business to Pizza Express. So I went to talk to the board and said, look, this is not, you're not serious about international expansion. At the time, it looked like there was going to be some kind of MBO or something was going on. And um, the chief executive and the chair said, look, don't, I, was, I said, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to leave and, and do something else. And they said, well, don't go, stay with us and do what they call special projects. It's a bit of a, my dad always says, if you've got a title like that, you're the first to go in a redundancy. It's probably not wrong. <laughs> but um, <coughs> anyway, they offered me this job and I ended up sort of working for the board. But the what the where the magic of that was, was that I shared an office with two very clever people. And I shared that office with them for about 18 months. What a joy. I mean, I sat and we were a public company at the time, Pizza Express were. And during the course of those 18 months, I learned what it was that Pizza Express were doing. I understood how they had created shareholder value. I understood the return on investment model. I understood this replicable, simple business model. I understood what it was that they were doing and what made them brilliant. And that gave me such a lot of confidence that by the end of this time sitting in the office, I was like, I get this, you know, I, I actually really understand what you've done here, which is brilliant, by the way. I mean, they they were the benchmark and probably still are. Um, very, very smart. I also had started to spend a lot of time and really understood what it was that they'd done with the PLC and why they'd floated. So again, you know, asked so many questions, spent time with really great people and learned how it was done. So when I got to sort of my about 27, 28, I just thought, you know, I can't carry on with somebody else telling me where I've got to be on a Monday morning. You know, if I want to have a family in my 30s or, you know, I ever want to 
hold the pen to write my own story, which was my thing. I wanted to be independent and freedom. I was very, and have freedom. I was very, very much driven by this freedom. Um, thought you're gonna have to go and do it yourself, Sarah. And having learned that, I've then applied that to, I mean, everything. It, it was the, it's the core learning of so much of my, of my investment and my journey, not just in hospitality. So I was very lucky to, I've been surrounded by brilliant people very early on, seen it as an opportunity, asked all the right questions, learned from it, and then went on to sort of, you know, do it myself, basically. Long answer that was to a short question. Just no, it's such a great story. And I, 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 many people haven't heard it. And lots of people want to know more about this backstory with you. And I think it's, it's inspiring for a lot of people listening. When I hear it, I feel like you did a real life MBA in that 18 months you, you worked with brilliant people and it was literally like you were getting paid to learn. That's what I hear. And um, and uh, I've actually been given special projects titles myself a few times by myself. So I know I'm, I'm the first one to be made redundant. <laughs> that was so true. But, uh, but Urban Legend uh, is that you then had this idea uh, for an Indian restaurant chain and you pitched yeah. it to the Pizza Express folks and, and they rejected it. Is that true? Yeah, so I did, right? So I, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I want to do, I want to do this. I, I need to go off and be independent. Basically. I can't, um, I was very, my diary was very much, somebody else controlled my diary. And I, that, that was, I was starting to feel claustrophobic. Um, so I, I said, you know what, looked around Indian food market, very, very saturated market. Was, at the time there was 10,000, um, independently owned Indian restaurants, but no chain, like nobody had created a brand. And I thought, well, I know how to do that. I'm going to do that. I will, I'll, I want to have the largest chain of Indian restaurants in the UK and sat down with the board and said, look, this is what I want to do. Will you back me to do it? And, you know, at the time there was a lot going on at Pizza Express, a lot of changes. It subsequently ended up delisting, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, you know, no, Sarah, we do pizzas. We don't do curry. It's like, oh, yes. OK. So I just thought, right, I'm going to go on and do it myself. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Although I did end up, long story short, and that it, this is a long story that I'm cutting short, I did end up doing it with Clapham House Group that was actually founded by the ex-chair and finance director of Pizza Express. So although I had got backing from a different group of people, I actually ended up competing with them for to buy the same business. And I ended up doing that with them and a different business called Nutra Health, which was a similar business model to Clapham House, but in nutraceuticals with the people who were going to back me to buy the Bombay Bicycle Club. Sounds a bit conv convoluted, but that was a long story cut short. No, it makes it makes sense because when you read, um, you know, you listed this company, you created that company. Sometimes it looks, I don't know how you managed to do it. And I always try to work out the timeline. Timeline, exactly. It makes total sense. Yeah, those two were sort of simultaneous, really. And that's actually how I met my husband. Uh, we did Nutra Health together and he ran Nutra Health. Uh, he was the CEO of Nutra Health. Well, I was, that's what I was going to say as well for people listening. You know, starting one business sounds hard enough. The fact that you, you know, you seem like you're running multiple, uh, you know, listed and potentially listed companies all at the same time. It, it just seems unfamilable. But you have partners, right? In this case, your husband that you're working alongside. That that kind of, I guess, makes life a little easier, doesn't it? I mean, having that person that understands that you're not doing a nine to five. No, completely. I mean, I, I define success in any business is when I've made myself redundant. So I start anything and try and make myself redundant from day one. And sometimes that take, that can take years. And sometimes you can do that really, really quickly. And it, it depends on the level of investment. Uh, it depends on how, it, you know, have I founded it? Am I critical to it? It depends on the team around me. It's, you know, it, so, but it, I, I always strive to make myself redundant wherever I possibly can. I think this is a crucial learning for the audience listening, and I don't want them to forget this. There's a lot of people uh, that we help that have uh, are struggling in their business, and it turns out a lot of the time they're struggling is because they've made themselves the centre of that business. Mm. And, and that feels good because you've almost secured yourself a job, but it makes it hard to scale because you're not willing to Very. release perhaps some of the things you're good as a generalist at to a specialist because you feel like this is what you do. And then people get trapped by their own business as well, right? Oh, completely. I mean, it's so often I, I meet people who have exactly that. Nothing can happen in that business without their say-so. But 
you know, I'm very driven by by this need for freedom and the independence. And I feel that the thing that I trade more than anything, the most precious thing that I have is time. And that's what and I'm I am almost ruthlessly protective, I think, of my time. Uh, fiercely, I suppose I should say, protective of my time. And that when you have that mindset, you are always looking of ways in which you can, you know, short-term pain for long-term gains. So, okay, it would be easier if I were to do this job myself now, but if I can go through this process three, four, five, ten times with this person in the end, I won't get the phone call. And it does make a real, once you can make yourself redundant from a business, you, it's successful. Well, that, that leads me nicely on to talking a little bit for a second about how to get investment. Cause I think this subject probably links to it when you're yeah. making a decision to invest in a business. Um, I bet this is one of the criteria. It, will the business survive if suddenly the founder couldn't go to work anymore? Am, am I right? Yes and no. So when I look at an in investments, I'll look at few things. So I'll firstly look at like, is there actually a need for this? Like, does anybody want what it is that you are trying to sell, what you're producing or what service you give or, or whatever? Then I'm like, who are these people that need it and how do I get to them? So is there a route to capturing those people so basically how am i going to market to those people how am i going to communicate and then how am i going to convert that into sales with these people can i see that and then third is always and what makes you the person or the people better placed than the person stood next to you or down the road to do this and make this a success? What are your chances of making this a success? Do you come with some history, some experience that's relevant, or are you just that person with that grit and that drive that will not let it go until until you kind of find the business model within and you make it work? But um, So I always look at those three things, and I think that's very important when you pitch is to remember those three things, like, you know, some people come into the den and they'll go, uh, or not even just the den. I mean, I'm pitched, see so many decks all the time and they start off with this crazy big number, you know, size of my market is 2.6 billion <laughs> worldwide. And you're like, what? Nobody sells to 2.6. You're not going to, you're not going to start a business and today be selling to 2.6 billion worldwide, you know? So it, it's, but it's, it's, what is the need for the product? Are you, innovating or are you basically just doing whatever you love and just doing it better decide which you are um funnily enough i was with um joe fairly a couple of weeks ago who founded green and blacks and it was so interesting to compare how the two of us approach business and the advice that we both give so she's very much like you need to innovate you need to be different and i'm not i'm like no I, I haven't got time to, I don't, I don't have the patience to innovate. Um, I want to do what people already love, just do it better. Cause then I know mm. I've got a captive audience. And I thought that was really interesting. Anyway, that's just got a bit, a bit of a digression there. No, I love that though. That's, a, that's that, by the way, I just for the audience is listening to that. Getting advice from different people can be confusing, can't it? Totally. So, if, you know, so, so totally. what do I do? Do I, do I innovate? <laughs> Or do but I just reality, do what I'm good at and be better than anybody else at it? You know, that, but the it. reality is, is that we're both right, actually. Yes, that's right. Um, and so what you have to do is, you know, when you when you look at any anybody's journey or, or is what are you good at? You know, play to your strengths. Some level of self-awareness is so critical because you need to surround yourself with your weaknesses, the things that you're not good at. So you need to understand who you are and what, what it is that you're good at. It's so important um, in business, so important in life, actually, but it's extremely important in 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 business. So, I, yeah, I think that's that that is the reality is that is that we're both right. You've just got to find your path. 
And, you know, I'm not a great innovator, actually. I'm not brilliant creative. If you give me a blank sheet of paper, I will stare at it. Whereas if you give me a sheet of paper that's already got five lines on it, you know, I'll give you a paragraph. I'll give you a page. Um, and it's the same. I, you know, I walk into a bar or a restaurant. Again, you give me a blank room. I could not create that magic, but I can walk in somewhere and go, this is magic. We just need to do this, 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 and this. Then it's perfect. Then let me go in inside of it and put together the, the simple replicable business model. And then let's have lots of them. You know, I can do that and I can see that. I just, but if you gave me the box in the first place, nothing would happen. Whereas if you gave it to Jo from Green and Black, she'd create this wonderful space. I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Taylor Brands, for supporting this podcast and entrepreneurs. Taylor Brands are aligned with our mission to help you start and grow a business and already empower millions of customers around the world to kickstart their business. With their AI-driven one-stop shop for aspiring small business owners with everything you need to jumpstart your business, such as a logo maker, business mailbox, online and physical business cards, printed merchandise, social media tools, and so much more. To find out more about Taylor Brands and how they can help you, click the link below and get 40% off your first order using the code PEP. Now, let's get back to the podcast. I, 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 I'm, I'm feeling very uh, uh, emotional when you explain this because I know a lot of our audience, they struggle with this concept of, oh, I don't have an idea to start a business. Well, work with someone that's good at coming up with ideas or go work with someone that's already got an idea because there are two types really there. They're, they're the people that come up with the idea but that, that need help. Frankly, I'm one of those people. I've got an idea all the time, yeah. but, but yeah. I need help to scale it. Right. Yeah. So, so I have people, I bring in people to help me, for example, the podcast, make sure we get the audience. I have the initial spark, but not the execution support and, and vice versa. My co-founders normally are brilliant at the scaling, the execution bit, but the idea and holding on to a necessarily initial idea is not necessarily their strength. So finding that opposite and accepting what you're doing there, which is amazing, you know, knowing where your weakness is and just saying, look, that's yeah. my weakness. And that's, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing that you, you admit your weakness. Oh, completely. I mean, it's a strong thing. It's great. Like it's, it's great, um, to, to acknowledge your weaknesses. We've all got lots of them. Um, and it's, ve but it, it's, it, it's not just a positive thing. It's, it's an essential thing. You know, you, I think we can be very guilty of hiring people in our sort of mirror image. Cause we think, Oh, well, let's have more of me. Cause I'm doing a cracking job. Actually, no, you know, you need to hire, the people you need to surround yourself with the people who are, are not not the same as you that you know that actually help you with your weaknesses and together as a team you become the finished product and if i look at your career you've stuck to this i mean you, you've basically bought companies and scaled them so you know it, you, you've seen the potential in something and and gone and scaled it or you've invested in other people's ideas and helped them scale it so you've you've really fine-tuned your ability and focus yeah, in on I, that, I, that bit. I know where my sweet spot is now. Like I know what I'm good at. Um, and I also know what I'm not good at. And I'm very quick to say to people, I'm actually not the right person for this. You know, this is, I, I wouldn't be the best person to help you. There are people out there that are better than me at this particular bit. Um, but I've definitely, you know, I'm definitely that, the bit where you've got, you've proven your concept and, you need to hone the model. You need to sort of fine tune it, simplify it, and then roll it out really quickly. Growth. That's definitely my sweet spot. It's it's for sure. It's the bit I'm best at. And I would actually say for a lot of entrepreneurs, that's majority of, of the weakness. Fine tuning something. All you ever want to do, and I speak for myself mainly here, is is is, is add more things, do more things, not yeah, simplify it. And it's funny you should say that because for years I really struggled to call myself an entrepreneur for that very reason. I didn't feel like a real entrepreneur because I never came up with the idea in the first place. Um, even when I said I'm going to have the largest chain of Indian restaurants in the UK, I still went out and bought a really small one and made it the largest Indian chain. There's no, there's no doubt about that. You, in my mind, you're an entrepreneur, though. I mean, the definition of an entrepreneur has got confused, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I think it's someone that that makes a business work. I mean, it doesn't matter what part of that business. I've got an accountant who's an entrepreneur, for example. You know, they make sure the accounts are run properly. That's a pretty yeah. important part of running a business, right? 
Yeah, it's interesting though. For, so for years, you know, exactly the same, you know, because most entrepreneurs are the early stage actually. Um, and yeah, for years I was like, oh, I'm not, no, I'm not really, I'm not really an entrepreneur. I'm just business, just what? like business, you know, but now I'm happy to do you're an honest entrepreneur because I, I could tell you, if you actually look at most businesses, Steve Jobs didn't come up with the Apple computer. You know, like it, it's not, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's famous for, you know, also buying Nest. This, you know, he didn't invent these companies. He, he again, like you, the, the real skill actually is, yes, inventing is one element, but really there's many people that come up with an idea that goes nowhere. It's about that scale. And, and so um, it's, it's, the world's littered with, with, with brilliant businesses that, that, that the initial idea would never have gone anywhere if they hadn't had, frankly, a brilliant entrepreneur like yourself come in yeah. and, and, and make it scale. And then I there's want- also... The- there's another there's another level then after that you know i'm uh like i set up nightcap this year um which i floated on the stock market early on this year and that's doing really well we're we're market cap of 40 million at the moment which is great in a year that's phenomenal i don't know right? how you've done that i was just reading that london cocktail club you bought right i was just like yes. how have you done that in a year i have never listed a company so i was reading that thinking how have you done that it's in a year? really i mean i like public markets it's it's fun but i but i, I will i will come back to answer the question but what i was going to say is you know like i very clearly, I know, you know, I can get it to sort of 150, 200 million. But then if somebody wanted to take it to be like, I don't know, 1.5 billion or a billion, I'm not sure I'm the right person for that. Like, I'm, you know, <laughs> so, do, you know, there's, I think different people have different, different strengths. Like in the public markets, I know how to get to sort of 150. I know what I've got to do. And I know, I know exactly what I've got to do to get there. Um but then, you know, once you sort of M and B size, you know, and you're like half a billion or a billion, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I'm the right person to do that. You know, there's probably somebody better at that point to have in the business. I would never leave. I'd always be around, but I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm quite entrepreneurial. So there comes a point at which you then really have to hand over to somebody who's much more structured. It might be that you're not interested in it because isn't it just Possibly. more of the same to get it to those I've also those, never done it, numbers? to be fair. I've actually never done it. So maybe, you know, who knows? I might get there and go, oh, it's quite fun actually, but I don't know. Yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. You might do it by accident. Because I think <laughs> the other thing is, and, and, and just reading uh, about your career, I mean, I know this whole work-life balance thing is thrown around a lot. And, and you know, I think you talked a little bit about this earlier, about the, the intensity of making a business work, but but also enjoying it and knowing when to step out. And, you know, like I always say, I, I, I'm happy personally to work two years really hard on something. Then I want the freedom to, to not have to work that hard so I can be with my family. But I think there is that work-life balance. But I guess there's also an element of like a $1.5 billion company if you're – CEO of that 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 is a lot of traveling probably because you have to have international expansion yeah right there's no no one market's going to be big enough even the US probably to start talking those numbers so then you're on a plane all the time aren't you and that that's perhaps not what you want no it's, I mean yeah I that definitely would not be what I would want at all you know again it's all about making yourself redundant so uh, I'm not likely to be ramping it up I'm much more likely to be making sure that the teams are empowered to do the job so that um, they need me less and less as time goes on. Um, but yeah, the work-life balance, as we call it, is is really important to me. And, and actually, I I don't even know if not that's, I think that probably is the right way of saying it. But, you know, like I've never, I've never strived to have a career path ever. You know, people say, oh, can we talk about career path? And I'm like, I just don't believe in them. I really don't. Um, I believe in life paths and your career's got to fall into line. And I think, you know, if I think about all of the decisions I've made my whole life with my work, it's been because of something I was doing in my life at that time. And it's I've needed it to fall into place. I've needed my career to fall into place because I love working. Right. I actually love what I do. So I never want to give it up, even though I had four kids, very you know, four kids in four years was was pretty epic. But at the same time, I didn't want to stop working, but I then had to change the way that I worked, that I was in charge um, and I could still use my brain. I could still enjoy myself, but I was a mom and I, did, I didn't want to delegate that. I wanted to be a mom and that was the most important thing to me in the world. And, you know, so I think it's it's always trying to make your work fit your life. And I think 
when you do that, you become non-compromising. And in becoming non-compromising, you become pretty blimmin' focus. Like you, you know what you've got to do. You know the focus. You know, you know what you, it becomes very easy the things to say yes to and the things to say no to when you're very when you're driven by life rather than by career. Unbelievable. You you also had uh, you know four children in four years. You 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 did that in record time as well. I mean that's that's <laughs> we were really lucky. That's actually. an achievement. As I just I mean forget. Building a PLC company in a year, I mean, that, that's, that sounds like an easy thing to do. Four kids in four years, amazing. I think, I think um, it's, it's a subject I think a lot of people listening will resonate with because I think, and I know I do, it is difficult to have that ambition that you've clearly got, a lot of people listening have, and, and make sure you don't neglect your family. And I think one thing I've, I think when I read your history that you've done is like, for example, your, your husband is your partner in Nightcap PLC. So you're in it together again. So you're not yeah. living a separate life. No. So you get that time together because you're working on this special project uh, together. Yes, you have to be careful. I think it's not for everyone. We, we're we very lucky. We, we met in work and we've always, you know, we met starting a business together and we've always, always worked very, very closely. We work very well together. It wasn't always easy, but now we know, you know, I'm like, this is definitely your bit. You should, you know, this, I'm not great at this and vice versa. That works. You've just got to be very careful when you do that, that you find it's not always work. You know, certainly when we started Nightcap, we actually slipped back into a, a bad old habit of, um, it became all consuming. Trying to do the float was very stressful. Raising the money was stressful. It's all stressful. Um, and that became all consuming. And we, we, we started to have to have some, bring some rules in again, you know, like we will not look at our phone until the kids have gone to school because what was happening is we'd see something on our phone and then we'd be discussing it. And I'm trying to make breakfast for the kids and we're trying, it was just, I'm like, hang on, you know, this is not working. So you ha- you do have to be really strict and again, know yourself and know each other to be able to say, look, this isn't working for, for me. And it, sometimes in the evenings we will just say done, you know, do not. I'm all, we, we also go for, we walk quite a lot. So when we go for a walk, sometimes we like to be like, right, half an hour as a catch up. And then I just want to dream. You yeah. know, I just want to I, talk nonsense. It's such a good tip. I mean, I do think working with your partner, I, I worked with my partner for 15 years as well, uh, nonstop seven days a week. And I, I loved it too. And I think what you're talking about there is, is it's working with family, friends, any of these things, you've got to have these rules in place to make sure there's balance. And I think yeah. one of the keys, I think, and I'm, and I'm wondering if you agree, is that having a very different job role as well. So you don't cross over each other's decision making powers. So you trust each other and let each other do do your thing. Yes. I mean, we I guess there is a bit of a blurred area in between the two of us at times. But and that the most important thing really is for the team sometimes to know the difference. Um, we've worked together so long now and so closely that we rarely get that wrong because we just know inherently or, you know, we're very quick to say, oh, I need some help on this. Like, can you just sense check this? Can you just, you know, what do you think of this? So we're the, the lines, I guess, can be a bit blurred between the two of us. Um, but that, that does work and and it helps that we both have quite a good understanding of of what each other does as well you know i think that's important now you mentioned earlier your kind of your criteria i guess for deciding whether or not to invest in a company or, or buy a company and and I, I think that's great i wondered you know you, you when you were raising money yourself if um you know, how you approached getting investment. Do you think there's a method we could teach people or, or a way to do it that you think is 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 good best practice? Good question, really. Um, I mean, I think answering those three questions is really, really important. Um, I mean, the, the la- latest money I've raised was at IPO. So when we actually floated um, a year ago, and then also we raised a lot more money again in, April, May of last year when we acquired another business. So it was, you know, our presentations are always the same in the sense that, you know, you you sell the big picture. What are we doing here? Why are we even in this room? Why are we having the conversation? What's the goal? 
um, you know, we want to create the leading bar group in the UK in quality late night party bars. Simple, dead easy to understand. And we're going to do this by organically rolling out the brands that we have now uh, with a better than average ROI model of 75%. And this is the business model. And we're going to do it by buying um, other businesses that whose balance sheets are in a mess because they've taken on too many too much debt during COVID, but their PL is really strong because the demand is there within our target market. That's it. That's that's nightcap basically. Um so, so we start off with this is what we're gonna do. And then you really kind of answer, well, how are we doing it? What are we doing? What have we done? You know, it depends on which stage in the fundraising you're at. So if you're trying to buy another business, you'll remind them of everything that you've already done so far the solid underlying business that's really important that what what it is that people are invested in investing investing in yes you can talk about the future but underlying is a really solid simple replicable business model that's what you need the money for so for every pound you give me this is what i'm going to give you back really important to understand and then of course you finish you know so you tell them how and what and who you know who are we and why are we better placed than others to be able to do it? Um, and then you finish on, you know, here's a summary of what we've done. And this is this is you know, this is what the next year is going to look like. So, I mean, public markets are slightly different than than personal. You know, if you if you're pitching to angels. In fact, interesting um, when you raise money on the public markets, when you meet with the larger institutions who've got big, big funds, um, those meetings are actually weirdly a lot easier um, than they are if we meet with loads of high high net worths. You know that might have it's less emotional by... in a way, isn't it? It's more clinical. Totally, they might have. You know, yeah. on the one hand, one business might be investing five million, and the other one might be investing twenty five grand. And actually, it's the person with the twenty five grand that you you probably invest. You need to invest more time in. Yeah. It's, it's funny, I interviewed Nick Jenkins, who spoke very highly of you, by the oh, way. I love him. One of my favorite people in the world. He enjoyed in, his investment with you, and he was telling me. But he was saying that um, if he'd gone on Dragon's Den with his business, he would never have raised money from any angels because he was losing money and every card sold lost money. You know, if you scale it, you're going to lose even more money. So he would, yeah. uh, he would have got kicked out of the den, which is an interesting point, isn't it? That sometimes I think partly um, maybe the best practice is know your target audience for the investment. For sure. And I think, you know, like I think investors are a lot more educated now in that type of business model as well. He was very early to market. I think now those, um, those very highly marketing driven um, so what is the cost of customer acquisition? What is the lifetime value of that customer? Those models, there's a lot more of them about. So we're much more used now to seeing businesses like his where actually if you take away the marketing spend, you can see that there's a very replicable, replicable model under there. But because of churn, you have to keep filling the funnel all the time. So you still, in order to, for the business to remain static, you have to feed in a lot of marketing. But at the same time, then you have to pump in more for the business to start to grow. But actually, when you look at the cost of customer acquisition versus lifetime value, it's a phenomenal business, right? But I think we're a lot more used to seeing that type of business model now, certainly than we were when Nick had Moonpig. Um, you know, he was very early in that kind of beautiful direct marketing, lovely business model. Well, I want to ask so many more questions of you. I've literally got eight more questions that I don't have time to ask. So. I talk so much, Simon. I'm so sorry. No, I've really enjoyed having you on. No, no, it's uh, it's awesome to have you on, and and I and I've really learned a lot about about uh, investing and how it works, and, and lovely to hear your story because so many people want to know the backstory, and I I think I've got a scoop because we've actually got the whole story there. So thank you. I wanted to ask you about the metaverse and how that's going to play out with with the food and drink business and socialising, but we have to do it another time. We'll have to do and I, I want to I want to um, I want you to write a book about how you built uh, a, a, a nightcap PLC in a year like that. So. Please, please tell me you've got a book in the pipeline. Oh, do you know what? It's so funny. I was having this conversation with somebody recently. They're like, please tell me you're going to write a book. And I'm like, what would I write? I don't know what I would write. 
I'll write it for you. And I'm dyslexic. I, 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 I think I've written enough of a book just in my notes today. I'm dyslexic. I could write a book for you. That's what he. That's what he said. He was like, "Babe, you've just given me a book in like half an hour of a walk." Yeah. And I'm like, exactly. No, that's like all three you need pages. to do is get someone to walk alongside you with a with a. Uh, yeah, tape that's what there. he said. Actually, he said, uh, "I think you just need to go on a walk in the mountains in Switzerland, and you'll write a book in a day." Perfect. I was like, Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, just, Maybe just one think day. about all the people you will help, Sarah. That's how you know. Yeah. Look at it that way. Not just the wonderful climate and beautiful walk and and all that therapy of releasing all that knowledge, um, but just think of all the people that help. I want to buy that book and I want to plug a book for you right now. That's that's what I'm thinking. But we we don't have one yet. So please one please day, get on that. I, yeah, one day I think I will. I will get. I will do a book. I will one day. So, when I when I've got more to talk about. We, 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 I've got. I also think you should call it. By the way, uh, a secret, a special projects. Just oh. a title, free. Get that trademarked. Um, so, um, but one final question, just to end the podcast: If you went back to that young Sarah in Paris, um, what advice would you would you give her? Um, I would say because I learned it very late. I would say embrace imposter syndrome. Little do you know, it's going to be your superpower absolutely love that i think people who feel imposter syndrome actually drives you to make sure that no one actually thinks i always think so no one sees the rhino coming right like you go into the jungle and the rhino looks so big and so enormous and he looks so slow you just think "Ah, he's gonna be fine he's not gonna attack me he's like no one sees the rhino right because you you just underestimate him and you know, if that's how you feel sometimes when you walk into the room, remember nobody sees the rhino coming and allow it to be your superpower because without a doubt, it has been mine. Yeah, I like it. Forget white elephant in the room. Grey rhino, rhino in the room. Rhino in the room. Be the rhino. Be, be the one everybody underestimates. It's completely fine. No, and, and I and I know it to be true because I've, yeah. I've I've been to Whipsnade Zoo and saw the rhino thinking it's not coming towards me, and next thing you know, it scares you, there coming you straight go. at you, and it's they so run powerful, so fast. They run so they run fast. so fast. Yeah. For my American listeners, Whipsnade is a zoo in England. But anyway, so <laughs> it's um, no, I, I I love that, and I've never heard anyone say it, and I'm going to look at rhinos in a new way, and um, <laughs> and and I. <laughs> I loved having you on the podcast today. I have really enjoyed hearing your story as a, as a fan, as someone that admires you. And, and I know my listeners will be feeling the same. So thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you, Simon. And thanks to anybody who, who has listened. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to our podcast today. And I hope you got value from it. Please feel free to follow us on any of our social media channels. And if you have any questions about business, ask us, we will help you. Again, we want to thank our sponsor GoDaddy for supporting this podcast. From naming your business and buying a domain name to building a website for free, GoDaddy has you covered. GoDaddy provides us entrepreneurs with all the help and tools we need to grow a business online. You're not alone entrepreneurs. See you in the next one.